It is a pleasure to welcome Noddy Holder from Slade to Noise11.com. And I, I, won't, I won't say it. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the sign. Good man. <laughs> like it. <laughs> uh, uh, look, you know, your music's been so, so uh, much part of my life for such a long, long period of time. I mean, uh, when things started happening in, the, in England in the late 60s and then... Uh, flew over into the 1970s, it must have been hard to sort of comprehend the longevity and importance musical history that you were creating at the time. Well, we didn't realise at the time, obviously. We knew we were making some good records. We knew we got a great stage show from the reaction of the audiences and the amount of record sales. We knew we got something going for us. But it didn't happen overnight. We were together five years before we got a hit record in, U in Europe. So it was a long, hard slog. And you come to a point as you go along that, in that period where you think to yourselves, is it ever going to happen? Are we doing the right thing? Uh, but it, 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 with rock and roll, you've got to be in the right time, the right place with the right record. And that's what happened for us. As soon as we clicked with the first hit, it was like a snowball then. It was rolling down a hill, collecting more and more snow. And uh, we just turned the records out. And luckily for us, they became hits. And um, this is what the new album's all about. Come on, feel the hits. It's sort of a collection, a definitive, from 1970 right through to 1991. When I left the band at that point, I'd been with the band in 91. I'd been with the band 25 years by then. And uh, it's the cross section of all our singles uh, up to that point. Uh, well, there was no more singles after that. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's got the big ones on, obviously, the big hitters, the big rockers. But it's got some of the ballads we bought out as well. And the record company wanted to put out a definitive collection, which is what this is. The double CD has got 43 tracks on it. Uh, the double vinyl's got 25 tracks on it. And originally, we signed a new deal with a new label last year, and their plan was always to bring out a best of as the first release on the new label. And um, we, I didn't realise till they told me we hadn't had a best of out for over 15 years, which has surprised me. But I think it's even better now that we've brought it out at this period of time because Slade was always a band that put a smile on people's faces, cheered people up. And I think it's exactly what we need at, at this point in history now. So it's worked well. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Everyone talking about Slade coming out on vinyl. I mean, look, Noddy, I, all, all I remember were the vinyl era. <laughs> it was That's probably worth it was it was all now. vinyl back when it was first yeah, starting yeah, out. Yeah. Good man. That's probably worth a bit of money now, those. <laughs> On the original <laughs> Polydor as well. Oh, excellent. I always remember when uh, when I first uh, heard the records and then bought the records and then read uh, the credits on the records, the name Chaz Chandler, who was your manager at the time, but he was ex-Eric Burden and the Animals, and um, I recently found out he was also uh, Jimi Hendrix's manager. He, he discovered Jimi Hendrix. He discovered him, produced him, managed him, brought him to the UK, and... You know, made his, you know, got his name known in the UK. He was unknown when he came to Britain. And uh, Chas sort of mentored him and they built up the image. And obviously, Jimmy, being the phenomenal guitar player he was, Chas had to capture that on record. And, uh, and he did, of course. And uh, it was only when Hendrix sort of finished with Chas and went back to the States that Chas was looking for a new act. And he didn't want another guitar player. He, as you say, he was in the Animals originally. He wanted a band. He, he wanted to see if he could do the same thing with a four-piece rock and roll nitty-gritty band. And he, he heard some of the stuff we'd been recording in a studio and he wanted to see us live. And he put us in a little club uh, right in the heart of the West End in London, which wasn't a rock, rock and roll venue at all. It was... Um, 
what we used to call in those days a discotheque and it was more a place where people danced and they danced to records and a live band on they still danced to the live bands and um Chas put us in this club it was called rasputins and uh we were in the middle of our first set, halfway through our first set, when he was coming down the stairs. And he, he got it onto the sort of main part of the club where we were performing. And he couldn't believe it, that the audience were all standing around the stage, watching us and dancing on the stage, some of them, with us. And he thought, I've, never, I've not seen a band ever do this before, as particularly in London, who the audiences consider themselves really to be cool. And um, he couldn't believe the reaction we were getting from the crowd, an unknown band, and they were really rowdy and cheering us and everything. And he signed us the next day, which was great for us because we got the benefit of not only him being in the animals, so he knew the inner workings of a band, a rock, rock and roll band, and he knew what he'd gone through with Hendrix as a manager. So we got the two sides of the coin benefit from that. Mm. When uh, uh, Slade were first heard of in Australia, I guess, you know, we were a bit late to the party because you'd already had uh, the Ambrose Slade album, uh, Play It Loud, had been released. And then uh, this yeah. one, Slade Alive, came along. And I remember well, that, yeah. getting this one uh, on vinyl back when it was first released. I would have been about 14 years old at that point. I could not believe the power and intensity that you guys captured on that record. I still, like, uh, Rolling Stones, Get Your Yayas Out, The Who, Live at Leeds, and Slade Alive, I would put down as the three best live albums of all time. Well, thank you, thank you. That was the album that broke us worldwide, definitely. And the great thing about that album was we recorded it in a, a very small venue in London, and uh, we recorded three nights on the trot. And uh, we, the, the, the one that turned out to be the album was all from the second night. And it was funny, really, that we, just before we'd do, gone to the gig, we had done the show in England that was the big pop show at the time, which was Top of the Pops. And uh, we had a big record there uh, on the chart called Cause I Love You. And we were buzzing because that record was number one, heading for number one on the charts. And so we were in a really good mood. We just performed it on top of the pops and we came straight from top of the pops in our fancy gear, <laughs> straight in the car to the venue where we were recording the, uh, what, was, what would have turned out to be Slade Alive. And uh, the excitement in the studio was fantastic. It just all worked well. It all fell into place, the jigsaw. And it was a great night. Everything was buzzing. The atmosphere was great. Um, we bought that album out, and I don't know what you'd translate in money terms. <coughs> I'm sorry, I just have a cough. Um, what you'd translate in money terms, but that album only cost us, even for the three nights recording and to mix it, £400. And it was in the charts all over the world for over a year. Most charts everywhere in the world. So the... Uh, the sort of profit margin on that album was brilliant for us. And it came at just at the right time. Because up until that point, we hadn't really been making any money or anything like that. We'd only just started to break through with hit records and become successful. But that album just took off. And particularly in Australia, when we came for the first time to Australia, we found out that Slade Alive had been number one in Australia for six months and our next album Slay Ed was the album that knocked it off the number one spot so when we arrived in Australia we had the number one and two album we got off the plane and three singles in the charts all at the same time we couldn't believe it and we come off a 28 hour flight from Britain a little bit tipsy, I might add, from drinking all the way. And we were greeted by a big barrel load of Foster's Lager that they, all the press and everybody wanted us to drink to get us pictures with it. And uh, it was quite a, a merry entrance to the Australian circuit. 
<laughs> um, one of the tracks on Slate Alive, uh, Darling Be Home Soon, a loving spoonful song. I've got to ask you about the burp. Was the burp staged? Was it staged or an accident? It was an accident. I had to burp. I, I you know, I'd, I'd just drunk some fizzy water just before we did that song and I burped in the middle of the track. But from then on, whenever we performed it, if I didn't do a burp in the middle, people would get disappointed. And as we, as we used to do it live after that, we'd quieten down. It was in the quiet piece of the song where we went really quiet. And you'd hear the audience burping. The audience would all start burping back before I'd even done it. And the audience would go mad if I didn't do the burp. But it was yeah. accidental when I originally did it, yeah. There's a live version of Get Down, Get With It on Slate Alive, but that had already been a single for you in the UK. It was That wasn't the first hit here. First hit we had in Australia for Slade was Cos I Love You, but you'd yeah, yeah. already broken in England with uh, Get Down, with, with get, get Down, Get With It. That was, um, I, was that a Little Richard song? It wasn't. Well, our version that we took it from, uh, with the, the version we heard was Little Richard's version, and we credited him on, on the record. We credited him as the writer, Pennyman, because that was the credit on his, on his version. But we found out he didn't write it and he didn't originally record it. He was originally uh, recorded and written by a guy called Bobby Marchant. So Bobby Marchant's publishers got on to us. They threatened to sue us because we hadn't credited him. But we didn't know the Bobby Martin version at that point. We knew the Little Richard version. And Little Richard's version had Pennyman on it, which is Little Richard's real name. So we credited him on ours. But he wasn't the writer originally. Uh, but, but yet it was. We heard it first in a club we used to play in our hometown. Uh, we, we heard the DJ playing it there. And it wasn't a well-known Little Richard song, but it used to go well in this, in this club. And uh, I thought when I heard it, I thought I could really sing this song. I loved Little Richard anyway. He probably was my main rock and roll influence. And um, I, loved, I loved the record when I heard it. And we went out and got a copy and I knew I'd be able to sing it. And uh, we put it together and we developed it over two or three years, finishing our act with it. We always finished our act with it uh, before we had hits. And we were searching for a, a hit single. We'd had a couple of singles out in the UK, which hadn't really done much business. And then Chas Chandler said to us, well, well, don't we try and get get down and get with it in the studio? Well, don't we try and get it down? Because a storm live, let's see if we can get it down and put it out. And we did. And it became a big hit for us all over Europe. Mm. Yeah, you talked about uh, uh, that first album, which was, uh, well, the first album after Slade Alive, the Slade album, uh, that's the one yeah, yeah. with uh, uh, Goodbye to Jane on it, um, Mama, We're All Crazy Now. What it didn't have on it was Cos I Love You and Look What You've Done. Uh, like the Beatles, yeah. you had this amazing uh, creative run where you were releasing singles that didn't go onto albums and then releasing albums that still had more hit singles. It must have been a, yeah. a, an incredibly prolific time for Slade. It was, but that was Chaz's idea not to put the singles on, on albums. Uh, he, he thought, it, you know, sometimes it could shortchange people. So, yeah, he followed the Beatles pattern that all the singles weren't on whatever became the current album. Uh, but that was shut down to Chaz. It wasn't our idea. That was his idea. But we were, we had got a, once we got our first hit, Because I Love You, and it was self-written, we never thought we could write a hit, and we never certainly never thought we could write a number one record. Um, but Chaz, he convinced us we could. He put me and Jim together as writers because we'd been writing in different formats and separately prior to that. And he said, I think if I put you, Jim and Noddy together, you can come up with something. He said, well, you've got to come up with something. He says, I want you to start writing hits for yourself. And um, Jim came round to my house in our hometown and he bought his violin along one, one afternoon because Chaz had demanded we'd bring a song to him. And uh, we wrote, because I love you, we just jammed on a sort of theme that we used to tune the violin, violin up in the dressing room before the show. And it was a little ditty we used to play in the dressing room to tune the violin. 
and we based the song on that really and we we wrote it and completely the whole lot in 20 minutes and we weren't sure we thought it's a catchy ditty it's a catchy melody and we took it to Chaz. i don't think we even played it to the other two in the band at that point we took it to Chaz, not convinced it was going to be a record and we played it to him acoustically me singing and the guitar jim playing the violin and Chaz said i think you've written your first hit and not only your first hit i think you've written your first number one and we went Oh, get away with your chas, you know, no way, no way. Anyway, we went in the studio, we recorded it very quickly. We didn't like it when we first heard it back. It didn't sound like Slade, and particularly following on from Get Down and Get With It. And we needed to slade it somehow. And we put on the boot stamping and the hand clapping that we'd done on Get Down and Get With It. And immediately we'd found the genre that became our trademark and it became that again became a monster hit for us all over yeah, and it got to number one in UK in two weeks and Chaz was right he could always spot a hit Chaz he got good good ears for a song and then we started to churn songs out and uh, you, you know he could say or oh, that one we're going to try as a single or that one not go on the album or whatever we usually there was always versions of who wanted what as the next single but Chaz had usually had the final say Chaz and the record company usually had the final say and generally they were right yeah because mm. look what you've done i think came straight after that and uh look i was a big Beatle fan at the time you well and still am uh you obviously uh it would have been hard to be a band from england in the late 60s early 70s mm -hmm. and not be a Beatles fan i detected Absolutely. a distinct john lennon influence in look what you've done and you know consequent songs that would come along after that was lennon your beetle well both all of them all of them i did i didn't uh, none of them stood out to me that, that that i just thought the beatles were fantastic and the best compliment i ever had because don the drummer in, in slade he'd he'd seen me with previous bands and that's why i was invited to join the in-betweens which was the band that then became Slade because he thought I sounded like Lennon I didn't particularly but Don did and anyway in New York in about 1973 it would be Chad we were recording in fact we were recording what what would become the Christmas record I think in this studio in New York and we used to record till 10 o'clock at night there and Lennon would be coming afterwards at 10 o'clock and record through the night. And uh, of course, <clears throat> we'd gone back to our, out to have a meal. We'd finished recording and Chaz was mixing a track. And Lennon came in. Of course, he knew Chaz from the Animals days. The Animals and the Beatles were big pals. And obviously through Hendrix as well. And Lennon came in the studio and said, I really love this guy's voice. He sounds like me. And I couldn't have got a better compliment than that. I thought that was just fantastic. <laughs> I think you might be right too. Uh, you did uh, uh, some amazing singles, one after the next, after the next, after the next. It was, you know, Because uh, I Love You, Look What You've Done, Mum, We're All Crazy Now, Goodbye to Jane. At this point, you still hadn't learnt how to spell Noddy. Can you spell <laughs> yet? No. <laughs> The, the reason the spelling came along, that was again with Cause I Love You, the first big hit. And we didn't like the look of it on the, what was going to be coming on the, on the label, on the record. Because I Love You, we didn't like it. We thought it wasn't rock and roll enough. And Chaz saw my lyric sheet that I've been using in the studio. And it was written in the dialect, the way we speak, our dialect from the Midlands in, in, in England. And it's the way we used to write on the toilet walls uh, in that dialect. Then he saw, cause I love you. And he said, well, why don't we spell it like that? It's your dialect. You can't get away from it. That's the way you speak. And uh, we put it on the label and it became a big successful sort of gimmick for want of a better word. And we use it on loads of records after that. And it, it became our gimmick. And later on, you got acts like the hip hop act, acts and, particularly Prince actually started to do that those sort of spellings on their on their titles maybe he nicked it from us maybe you never know 
I, I wondered the same thing, actually. <laughs> but it was a dialect from uh, Toilet Walls. Yeah. The, uh, the quiet right <laughs> version of Come On, Feel the Noise. Give me the Noddy Holder review of that. Well, it, I mean, it was, it was uh, helpful to us. Let's put it like that. They probably did a, pretty much a carbon copy of our version. I mean, we couldn't believe it when we'd done it in 73. It hadn't become a big hit in America. It had everywhere else in the world, but not in America. And then when they bought it out in 83, it, it was pretty much they'd obviously tried to copy our version. And um, we, it sold. The album it came from, their debut album, sold 10 million copies. It was the biggest selling debut album from any act ever and still stands 10 million on that debut album and it sold on the strength to come on feel the noise of course me and jim the writer my co-writer we benefited from it from the songwriting royalties so my bank manager was very 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 happy and uh, he still gives me a glass of whiskey when I go and see him now because he's, he's very pleased when the royalties come in from Come On, Feel the Noise, particularly from America, from uh, Quiet Riot's version. But it helped us as well because we were going through a fallow period in America, not in, not in Europe. We sort of had a couple more hits in Europe around that period with My Oh My and Run Runaway. But it made record companies in America sit up and take notice, what are Slade doing now? And because we just got these two monster hits in Europe at that time, they signed us up and we went back to America. And because MTV had become huge in that, in that era, in the early 80s, which had never happened in the 70s, obviously there wasn't any such thing as MTV. And it was a perfect medium for Slade. And we went on, there with with the video and with run runaway and the americans absolutely loved it they loved run runaway the video and it became a big record for us there mtv were playing it on heavy rotation and it was all with the scottish theme the scottish sound to it and we filmed it what looked like a scottish castle and the yanks thought we lived in the castle. They all thought we lived there together. So it, 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 it worked for us. It gave us a breakthrough in the States, in the charts. Even though we toured there constantly, a lot in the 70s, we not had a big, big monster hit single like we had every, everywhere else in the world. I thought uh, Slade, uh, as a band, you were incredibly spot on with the covers that you chose to do. And one of those covers I wanted to talk to you about was Janis Joplin's Move Over. I mean, a very female song. You say that it's over, baby. You say that it's over now. It was a, a, like the whole uh, genre of the song was female. And you took that song and turned that into a male song. Tell me about the choice of yeah. a Janis Joplin song. Well, I always knew, we, when we brought cover versions to the band or songs we wanted to be covered, we all had a free choice. Everybody was allowed, especially before we were writers, everybody had their own choice of what they could bring to the band. Uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes maybe it didn't work. But because I'd had a career as a singer long before I joined that band, I was in various bands. We played, you know, when, we, when you're playing in Germany for long hours, long stints in the clubs in Germany, I could be doing six hours a night and 14, 12, 14 hours a night at, at weekends. You know, you'd start at two in the afternoon till four the next morning. So I was able to sing in those era, blues, rock, jazz, R&B, pop. I was experiencing all those genres and I could sing all those things. So whatever people, the other band members brought to the band, I was able to do it. Sometimes I didn't like singing some of the songs they brought to the band, but some songs come out that I know I'm going to be able to do real good. And Move Over Baby was one of those songs. I knew when I heard Janis Joplin's, I knew I, knew I could do that song and do it from a male perspective. And that's exactly what happened. It became a big, big record for us on stage, big song on stage. People used to love me doing it. Uh, uh, and early on, we did quite a few cover versions. Well, we all, we all did all through our career. We'd always put at least one or two 
cover versions in the show. And usually the ones that work the best were usually the ones that I chose for myself because I knew what I could give them a different slant on the original as such. And Move Over was a great one for us. I mean, it, it was perfect. Mm. The one that opens uh, Old New Borrow Blue uh, just a little bit. Now, that's a. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you want, if, if I want to give somebody an example of Noddy Holder's vocal, I can always direct them to that track. Yeah. Well, that's another one that was my choice to do. I'd been doing that song way back in the early 60s. It, it, or I'd always done it in every band I'd been in, that song. I mean, we're, the. Probably the version that we took when we were the uh, in betweens or when we the Slade version was um, the Undertakers, for a band from Liverpool, they did a version. But the version I used to sing originally was from the original record, which was by a guy called Roscoe Gordon in the 50s. He did a version much more low key and laid back than the Slade version. But that's it, was such a great song and such an individual song. I took that, I, I sang that in different different variations for years, way before, I'd probably been singing it for 10 years before Slade recorded it. Uh, so I knew that I knew the song inside out. And as you say, it was a perfect, if you didn't know, if you needed an introduction, if you'd never heard me sing before, it's a perfect introduction to, for Noddy Alder's voice. <laughs> There was, there was only uh, one movie, Slade in Flame. Um, uh, mark out of ten. What do you think of Slade in Flame now? Can you can you distance yourself from that movie, watch it, and then give me a mark out of ten? I can distance myself now. I I always love the movie. A lot of uh, some of the band didn't didn't like it at all um, when we when we first did it. Now, in retrospect, I would give it. I'm going to be big headed now, I'm going to show off, and I'm going to give it nine out of ten. Uh, way back then, um, I think there was only me and Jim in, in the band that really liked it. Uh, Dave, Dave Hill, Dave, the guitar player, he never liked it, and, and he was put off liking it by what people were saying to him, that this will kill your career, this is not what Slade are all about. Because it was a serious, dark movie about what went on behind the scenes in the rock and roll business. And so Dave didn't like it, particularly when people outside were saying it to him. The fans didn't know what to make of it at the time. The film critics were great to it, funnily enough, which we never expected. But then, now, we, we're talking like, what, 45 years on now from the movie? The biggest film critic in UK now is a guy called Mark Commode. He's the biggest film critic in the country. And he writes Slade in Flame as the best rock movie ever made. He calls it the Citizen Kane of rock movies. And he's, he has done for years, he, he really writes the movie. And general consensus of, of opinion now is that it was, it's a great movie. And even the music in it, people now are writing as great music. Way back in the 70s, particularly the theme tune, even though Far, Far Away is in the movie, which was a big hit record for us, but the theme tune, How Does It Feel? We bought that out, and it was our first record that hadn't made the top five in UK for, like, in our string of hits days. Me and Jim, who wrote it, and, and, and we wanted to record it as the theme for the movie, nobody wanted to do it. Nobody, because it was such a different sort of song for Slade, Nobody wanted, wanted to record it. We did it. We, it came out really good in our eyes, in, in mine and Jim's eyes anyway. And, um, you know, it didn't sell any great quantities like we'd been used to. People didn't get great reviews, but it fitted great into the movie. Now, 45 years on, people are saying, probably one of the best records we ever made. But it wasn't like that at the time. It's weird how people's perceptions change over a period of time. Nobody really realised it as a as a slide a slide classic, if you like, of that period. But now they do. Mm. Well, at least the movie gave you actor on your resume, and years later you got to do <laughs> one episode of Coronation Street. So it was all worthwhile. Correct. And I did also in UK. You you might not know there in Australia, but I did a. a a series over here in, in the UK for five years 
it was a series called The Grimleys, and it was about uh, it was set in the seventies, and I was playing a music teacher in it. It was sort of a comedy drama show, so I was in that for five years in UK. Mm. Uh, when Slade came to an end, uh, nineteen ninety two, I think it was. They, you know, like had, had there ever been a reunion? You really just walked away from it, didn't you? I did. I did. I, I'd um, I'd been with the band. <coughs> Sorry. I'd been with the band um, 25 years at that point, and I felt we were on a bit of a treadmill. Um, it was album tour, album tour. And after 25 years with the same guys, it's like four marriages, really. You get four marriages, and there's going to be conflicts, of course. Uh, but we were always a happy-go-lucky band. We never had fights or anything like that. But I just felt we were getting stale. Well, I was getting stale within the band. And um, as you say, I walked away and we had no reunions or anything. Um, people change, you know, when you get to an older age, people change, dynamics in the band changed. Um, we all had different goals in life, I, I, I imagine. Um, I wanted to try other things. I always thought there would be a reunion. I always thought we'd get back together, put our differences aside, go back and maybe do a couple of world tours and stuff like that. But it never worked out that way. It, it, there was always some sort of conflict somewhere in the band between members, one way or another. And uh, so it never, never worked out that way. But I went on to have a career of my own that I enjoy. Yeah, well, you know, we might not have had another tour but we certainly have the music uh, come on feel the heat the uh, the latest compilation all of these great records that i've been playing for decades since the 70s <coughs> i love it it's been an absolute honor to uh, talk to you noddy holder i've enjoyed it i've enjoyed it it's great <laughs>